Hello and a very warm welcome to a brand new edition of World Panorama with me, Frank Pereira on Rajya Sabha Television. Over the next half an hour, we'll bring you a roundup of all the significant events to have happened around the world. But first, a look at the headlines. Iran, out of more than a decade of crippling sanctions and international isolation, announces economic recovery targets. Israel voices concern on a continued nuclear threat as Middle Eastern rivals fear Shia expansionism. Islamic State holding more than 3,500 Iraqis as slaves, more than 18,000 killed, says a UN report, points at brutal war crimes and even genocide. In an echo of the gruesome Peshawar school massacre, gunmen storm a university in Pakistan's northwest frontier province, 22 killed students, a professor and guards among them. And the U.S. presidential election fight set to begin in right earnest. State primaries to get underway in Iowa on the 1st of February to zero in on the final candidates. But let's begin with our top focus on the program this week. The end of a dark era for Iran. More than 10 years of crippling sanctions and international isolation for Iran came to an end this week. The landmark move comes in exchange for rolling back the scope of its nuclear activities under the Iran nuclear deal, something the U.S. and arch-rival Israel will be keeping a close eye on. And it also marks a paradigm shift of sorts in strategic equations in the Middle East. Here's more. The end of a decade of pariah treatment, the end of potential throttled. The Iranian economy, one of the last great untapped emerging markets, stands opened to international trade and investment again. The nuclear talks accomplished and resulted with guidance of the supreme leader of the revolution, the support of the nation and companionship of the pillars of the state is truly one of the golden pages of the history of this country. Already, economy rebound targets are being set. Iran hopes to attract 30 to 50 billion US dollars in foreign capital in five years. The transport minister announced Iran planned to buy 114 Airbus aircraft. That itself marks the beginning of a trade and investment boom that could reshape the economy of the Middle East. The Tehran Stock Exchange, long in a state of stupor, is ready to rev up to life. Iran can now return to the oil market and is expected to start exporting an estimated 300,000 barrels per day immediately. Iran will also have access to nearly 50 billion of some 100 billion dollars frozen overseas. The money may be used to import goods and services to renovate and modernize many of Iran's economic sectors. The country says the crisis was unnecessary, insisting it never wanted a nuclear bomb in the first place. But the P5 plus 1 group of powers and the IAEA argue that post the deal, the world is now a safer place, with close monitoring of Iran's activities to continue. Iran and the IAEA are now entering into a new phase. We are committed to continue our work in an impartial, non-political and factual way. But within the Middle East, the ripples are not all happy ones. Most Arab countries have raised concern at what they perceive as Iranian Shia expansionism. Sunni-ruled Gulf states view the nuclear agreement and the lifting of sanctions as a threat and a sign that the West is getting closer to Tehran at their expense. They fear Iran could become more daring in its interventions in the conflicts in Iraq, Syria and Yemen. Arch-rival Israel that had opposed the deal trashes it completely, saying the nuclear threat from Iran is bigger now than ever before. Were it not for our efforts to spearhead the sanctions and foil Iran's nuclear program, Iran would have already had nuclear weapons long ago. Israel's policy was and remained exactly the same to not let Iran achieve nuclear weapons. 
It is clear that from now on, Iran will have more means to use for its terror and aggression activity in the region and in the world. And Israel is ready to cope with any threat. Analysts say the optimism remains cautious, with the U.S. introducing new sanctions on 11 firms for supplying Iran's ballistic missile program. It's still likely to be a couple of years before Iranian citizens actually feel the benefits of larger sanctions being lifted. But outwardly at least, there's affirmation of Iran sticking to its side of the bargain and embracing a paradigm shift in its fortunes ahead. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha Television. Joining me for a chat this week to talk about this is Professor A.K. Pasha, Director, Gulf Studies Program, JNU. Professor, welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You know, the sanctions have finally been lifted. Now, what does this mean for Iran and what does it mean for the world as a whole? This is truly a historic development. Uh, three levels. One is uh, Iran, as you said, uh, uh, would benefit from uh, the lifting of the sanctions but it has agreed to accept severe restrictions on its nuclear program. And uh, this is going to be for about 8 to 10 years. Uh, the immediate benefit uh, uh, is the release of nearly 100 plus billion dollars which were frozen. And that would help Iran to invest in its economic uh, and infrastructure uh, development and providing relief to the people who have been reeling under very severe sanctions. Is that, uh, is that relief really going to reach the common man or do you see Iran using most of that money in some of the proxy wars that is fighting in the region? I don't think so because they have overstretched. Uh, and Rouhani came to power on the basis of lifting of these sanctions. And uh, if he doesn't blow back these resources, there will be an upsurge, uh, as you saw during the second term of Ahmadinejad. Iran badly needs to invest in its infrastructure and uh, in the programs, many of the programs uh, uh, through which subsidies are given to the people, those have been uh, severely restricted because of the limited resources. So there is great expectation among the people that their lives would be improved and the inflation will be brought down and uh, their standard of living, which used to be quite high, would be compensated because of this long years of sacrifice, suffering, and real agony uh, for many of the lower class uh, people. This is one. The other uh, is uh, because of the low oil prices, uh, it may not get much revenue. Yes. Because yes, the that's prices, a big problem. prices have really plunged 70 percent. So if they try to invest in countries like Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and so on, so for other hot spots, it will not only totally be met with countermeasures from Saudi Arabia, America, and other countries. It will be futile on the part of mm. Iran. So in that way, I don't think uh, the leaders uh, in Iran would be interested in expanding their sphere. And that expansion took place mainly as a form of uh, offense to defend themselves. Because Iran was under severe threat of regime change yes. right from 79. Yes. And Iran and the major powers were on the brink of war several times. Yes. The Americans threatened to bomb, the Israelis threatened to bomb. Bomb. So they went out of their way to uh, bring allies on their side, Syria, Hezbollah, and uh, the Iraqis, so on and so forth. So in that way, now that their national security has been safeguarded through this nuclear pact, uh, buttressed by support from the UN Security Council and also more importantly Russia, China, and other countries, or the, although they have developed their mil capability, mm -hmm. military capability has been developed at the cost of economic, probably, infrastructure. But uh, that uh, has now eased their national security concern. Indeed. So in that way, the Americans and the Iranians have now agreed to work for regional stability, peace and security. And Syria is the main target to have Geneva conference maybe tomorrow or so as per the mandate of the UN Security Council. But the question is, what about the others? Some of uh, the uh, neighbors of Iran are extremely jittery and they are worried of Shia expansionism. And is that fear justified? Yes, to a certain extent, the Saudis uh, and other smaller Gulf states are uh, uh, apprehensive <clears throat> because from the very beginning, right from 79 onwards, uh, this was a point of conflict because uh, the type of uh, rhetoric which used to come uh, went against the monarchies uh, as un-Islamic and uh, puppets of the United States, so on and so forth. Uh, 
uh, and that was seen as trying to undermine their security and territorial integrity. But I think uh, the American guarantees to these states remains in place uh, and uh, the Iranians themselves would not like to rock the bot mm. because if they try to disturb the equation, power equation in the region, the Americans uh, and the Israelis, more importantly, would uh, not take it so easily. And uh, the Iranians, I think, uh, are sensible not to disturb that equation. In that way, the Russians also are co-sponsors. Uh, they have uh, substantial influence and they would not like to see mm. an aggravation of the situation uh, to the extent where uh, intervention uh, would be possible and detrimental to all the parties. Indeed. All right. Professor, we'll have to leave to that. Thank you so much for putting things into perspective for us as far as this subject is concerned. Pleasure having you on the program. Thank you. Well, on that note, of course, we'll slip into a short break here. Still to come, suicide bombers and gunmen storm a beach in Somalia, killing dozens amid the country's raging civil war. That and much more still to come. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Rajya Sabha Television. Well, a new UN report says the self-styled Islamic State militant group has enslaved about 3,500 people in Iraq. Among them are hundreds of children who have been forced to take up arms and are being indoctrinated into terror. On the back of these disturbing findings come decisions on a stepped-up Western offensive against the Islamic State. Iraqi forces have also stepped up the right, or rather the fight, to clear Ramadi town of Islamic State control. Here's a detailed report. Rescue at last for a lucky few in Ramadi city of Iraq. It's nearly a month since the US-Iraq forces proudly announced they had recaptured the city from the Islamic State. But with pockets of Islamic State fighters still holed up around the city, complete rescue is far from complete. We have been hiding for 11 days under stairs without food and water. We drink filthy water, unfit for human consumption. We pour water through a handkerchief to purify and then drink. The state of Ramadi, once a teeming, vibrant city, says it all. Residential areas have been flattened by airstrikes. Over 3,000 buildings virtually destroyed. Burnt out carcasses of large vehicles litter roadsides. Manipulation of civilians here also raises concern about upcoming battles in Mosul, another Islamic State stronghold, and Fallujah, the longest held militant city at Baghdad's western gates. Fallujah is full of families, not like Ramadi. And in Mosul, more than 70% of the residents are still there. The biggest problem is how we enter the city while they're using families as human shields. They don't care how many they kill. The only thing they care about is Islamic State. A report by the UN Assistance Mission for Iraq and UN High Commissioner for Human Rights speaks of kidnappings, religious indoctrination of children into terror, sexual slavery and worse by the Islamic State in Iraq. The report says 3,500 people, mostly women and children, are believed to be held as slaves. The militant group is also responsible for over 18,000 deaths in Iraq since January 2014. 800 to 900 children, it says, have been abducted for military and religious training. The report details executions by shooting, beheading, bulldozing, burning alive and throwing people off the top of buildings. Mass graves have been discovered after more than a decade of conflict in the country. The UN says the violations documented could amount to war crimes, crimes against humanity and possibly genocide. And the High Commissioner has, uh, has stressed that obscene as this death toll is, it really scratches the surface. Um, it's uh, the, the horrors that the people of Iraq are facing are tremendous. Um, ISIL is abducting young children and in recruiting them 
putting them in the front lines of war. And in one case that we've documented, um, these children have then fled the front lines of war because they were scared. When they got back, they were executed by ISIL for desertion. These are the kinds of horrors that people are facing. Women have been uh, subject to sexual slavery. Severe restrictions are being placed on their movement um, and the movement of men. Um, those who attempt to flee are caught and executed and hung out publicly to send a signal to others not to, to, uh, to, to take part in this kind of uh, behavior. These are the kinds of horrors that the people of Iraq are fleeing. These are the kinds of horrors that the refugees who are trying to enter Europe are fleeing. Defense chiefs of seven nations, including the US and France, met in Paris this week, deciding to intensify the campaign against the Islamic State, both in Iraq and Syria. But that prolonged and extensive war looks uphill yet. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. In other news now, terrorists uh, raided a university in northwest Pakistan on Wednesday, timing their attack to a ceremony to ensure maximum casualties. Police say 22 people were killed, students, guards, policemen and at least one professor among them. Reports say that the militants scaled the walls of the Bacha Khan University in Charsada, northwestern Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province under cover of thick wintry fog before entering buildings and opening fire on students and teachers in classrooms and hostels. The gunmen attacked as the university prepared to host a poetry recital to commemorate the death anniversary of Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, after whom the university is named. The university has over 3,000 students and was hosting an additional 600 visitors on Wednesday for the recital. Confusion persists on who was behind the attack after one Pakistan Taliban spokesperson said the group took responsibility, while another spokesperson denied it. Pakistan has killed and arrested hundreds of suspected militants under a major crackdown launched after the massacre of school children in December 2014 in Peshawar. Well, here are some other big stories that made headlines across the world this week in our segment Club Watch. Islamist gunmen stormed a popular beachside restaurant in Somali capital Mogadishu on Thursday, killing 20 people. Two car bombs exploded about an hour apart. In between, gunmen approached from the beach, firing on diners. A siege followed, lasting eight hours. Al-Shabaab said it was behind the attack. The group has carried out frequent assaults on the capital. Al-Shabaab wants to topple the Western-backed government in Mogadishu and impose a strict version of Islamic law across Somalia. The nation has been in grip of civil war since 1991. At least 10 people were killed in a blast in Egypt's Giza province on Thursday as security forces raided a terrorist hideout near the capital, Cairo. The Interior Ministry said gunmen killed five policemen a day earlier at a checkpoint in Sinai Peninsula, a group affiliated with Islamic State that has been behind much of the anti government violence in Sinai since former President Mohamed Mursi's ouster is believed to be behind the attacks. The latest attacks comes days before the fifth anniversary of the popular uprising that brought down Morsi's predecessor, former President Hosni Mubarak. The man known as Jihadi John is dead. The Bay, the English language magazine of the terrorist outfit Islamic State, confirmed that Mohammed Imwazi or Jihadi John has died. Imwazi appeared in several videos depicting beheadings of Western hostages. Shown in the videos dressed in black, Imwazi became one of the world's most wanted men. The site intelligence group that monitors terrorist activity reported that ISIS published a eulogizing profile about Imwazi. Well, the U.S. presidential elections process is set to enter a more decisive nomination contest phase towards finalization of each party's final nominee. Democrat and Republican candidates are in their final face-offs with their fellow party contenders ahead of voting in primaries and uh, caucuses in each of the states starting February 1st. Here's what the picture looks like in both camps.
the final three contenders for the Democrats, of which Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders are the bigger hopefuls. They're ready for the final race, the nomination voting contest across the states that will see only one of them finalized as the man representing their party. The last internal Democrat debate before the primaries looked at gun control laws, medical care and more. I have made it clear based on Senator Sanders' own record that he uh, has voted with the NRA, with the gun lobby numerous times. He voted against the Brady Bill five times. He voted for what we call the Charleston loophole. We should not be selling military-style assault weapons. I have supported from day one an instant background check to make certain that people who should not have guns do not have guns. And then the Republican camp. Twelve candidates in the running here, with maverick Donald Trump, Jeb Bush and Ted Cruz touted among the frontrunners. Little denying the impact presenter Trump has had so far, despite excessive, sometimes even seemingly ludicrous statements. Former vice presidential nominee Sarah Palin endorsed his name. For him, as for others, the real test begins now, an indirect election where voters in each state cast ballots for a slate of delegates to the nominating convention in July. No lead is said to be safe now. We don't want to be the stupid people anymore. We're not going to be the stupid people anymore. Because right now we're the stupid people. We have the dumbest people leading our nation. They're leading us. They are leading us into the worst positions. And then there's the lack of seriousness, at least by the front-running candidate, that uh, I wouldn't know what his policies are, but when he doesn't know what the nuclear triad is, that's, that's cause for pause, I think. Uh, and his spokesman says, well, he doesn't need to know all the details about it because you just need to know he'll use it. <laughs> that's, that's not laughable. Uh, someone who proposes a 45% tariff across the board on China, it's not a serious proposal. It's basically the advocacy of a global depression that will wipe out the middle class in this country and see retaliation uh, that will, will create, will wreck havoc. Uh, so, I'm the only so, guy so why confronting is it gaining this. so much traction? I'm, I'm the only guy confronting this because people are, are anxious about their future this is not a political gathering, so we can move on. But the simple fact is that we have to restore a traditional role in foreign policy. And you can't do this by, you know, be rambling around by saying Putin can take care of ISIS. China can take care of North Korea. It's their problem. And the same, literally in a 24-hour news cycle, propose a 45% tariff on the country that you're saying it's your responsibility to take care of, of uh, North Korea. There, there needs to be candidates that stand up and say there's a better path than the path of the left, which is a path of retrenchment, and the path, you know, emerging part of the right that is, that is viewing this where we don't have a, uh, a security interest in areas where we do. I think we have to recognize that these threats are real, that they have a huge impact on millions of people in our country, and that the first objective of the President of the United States needs to be to keep us safe. And you can't keep us safe by talking trash without backing it up with serious plans. The all-crucial Iowa state will hold the first of the primaries on February 1st, to be followed by all 49 others and Columbia. The 2016 presidential election cycle includes nearly 20 major debates, including 10 Republican, 6 Democratic, 3 general election debates and 1 vice presidential debate. The Republican National Convention of State Delegates from July 18th to 21st will finalize the Republican presidential candidate. The Democrats will finalize their candidate at their convention from July 25th to 28th. The first of three general presidential election debates will be held on the 26th of September. November 8th is election day with electoral votes to be cast on December 19th. The new president and vice president will be inaugurated in January. The once in four years landmark fight is underway in bright earnest, the USA's biggest election festival. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha Television. Well, let's now shift gears to the world of sports and bring you some big news from sports arenas around the globe in our segment Sports Action. Tennis world number one Novak Djokovic has rubbished media reports claiming that he had deliberately lost a match in 2007. 
An Italian newspaper had claimed that he had deliberately lost to now-retired Frenchman Fabrice Sontoro at the Paris Masters in 2007. The Serb, then world number three, was beaten 6-3, 6-2 by Sontoro, ranked 36 places below him. The Australian Open defending champion, when asked about the report, said that it was not true and dismissed the allegations as absurd. Leighton Hewitt was ushered into retirement as Spain's David Ferrer ended the Australian former world number one's career with a 6-2, 6-4, 6-4 victory on an emotional night at Melbourne Park on Thursday. Hewitt, a two-time Grand Slam champion, scrapped for all his worth against the eighth seed but was unable to extend his record 20th and final appearance in the Australian Open men's singles to the third round. Once he has completed his doubles duty with Sam Groth, Hewitt's playing career will be over and he will turn his thoughts to becoming Australia's Davis Cup captain. Manchester United have denied that they met with Bayern Munich manager Pep Guardiola about the possibility of him replacing current boss Louis van Gaal. Media reports claim that the meeting took place last week in Paris, but United insists the story is not true. Guardiola will leave Bayern Munich this summer and he said that he has several offers from English clubs. Manchester City are favourites to recruit the Spaniard, but Chelsea and United have also been linked with him. And finally, amid the winter shivers here in India, let's take a look at those who take on the 20, minus 21 degrees Celsius chills in Siberia. I leave you with visuals of the holy epiphany ice plunge by the Russian devout. See you again next time.